Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi with The Media Speaks. If you watched me staring blankly into the camera on low def, uh, that would be because I was trying to sync these two cameras, and that's not always as easy as you would think that it is. Friends, that brings us to why you are all here, of course, the dum -D of the day. Unfortunately, I have so many dum -Ds that... Month. Oh, you're the dumb of the month. Excuse me, I did say day. Yes, dumb of the month. The stupidest stories in the month. And I've been, like, swarmed. There are so many stories. That, like, the first eight, I'm just going to give you the headline. Or we're going to be here for years trying to cover all of the stupidity. So go ahead. Uh, get yourself a nice glass of wine. Get ready. Because we've got nonstop stupidity coming. And you're going to love it. Oh, God, are they stupid. They're really, really bad. Um, one of the prisonplanet.com, Noam Chomsky, Jihadi John, and that's the one that's beheading all of the uh, non-Islamists, non-Islamists, the bonehead from Britain, Jihadi John and Charlie Hebdo, the uh, French uh, satirical magazine that was bombed by Islamist fascists. They were oppressed immigrants. That's right. They're not terrorists. They were merely oppressed immigrants. Yeah. Way to go, Nam Chamsky. Way to go. Um, moving right along to the other ones, of which they seem like they will never end. Fat activists demand to Facebook remove the I'm feeling fat emoticon. That's right. If you've just gotten done eating Easter dinner and, you know, you feel like, oh my God, I ate way too much, you are fat shaming if you merely make fun of the fat fact, the fat, that you feel fact. How's that? Um, and then it was, oh, the internet's like, I got so many articles I'm trying to shut down. So I'm getting rid of them as I go. Again, I'm going to go more in depth to these. These are, the, these are the runners up. These are the ones that were unbelievably stupid, but not stupid enough to make the actual reporting. I told you, this is going to be a show unlike any other. Stay with me here. Kit Daniels, Infowars.com. Feminists promote gender stereotypes on period pad messages posted in public. Uh, nothing gets your point across like running into a maxi pad. If you really want to send people away from your cause, then this is the way to do it. These feminists are the stupidest people. A feminist in Germany is writing messages on period pads and posting them around her city, one of which stereotypes men as being more disgusted with periods than they are rape. Imagine if men were as disgusted with rape as they are with periods. I don't know too many men that are just really all that yucked out by a period. Women like to yammer on and on and on. I'm on my period, so we all know when you're on it. Um, I don't know. It says the feminist alone, is Elone, says she is using the period pads to spread her message against rape culture. Rape culture. You know what? There is no such thing as any damn rape culture, for one thing. That's why they're mentioned here on the dumdy of the freaking uh, month award. This is in their head. It says, for example, if a guy posted a message on street signs stating, imagine if women were as disgusted with abortions as they are with dirty dishes, people would get upset, and they would have every right to be. For one thing, besides stereotypically linking women to cleaning, the message implies that all women in general are pro-choice, which isn't the case at all. But it's okay when they assume those kinds of things from men. And that is, friends, exactly why it's getting mentioned at the Dumdy of the Month show. Don't forget this. Cop threatens to confiscate four-year-old's bike. That's right. The kid was on a trail. He was riding on a trail. You can't do that in America today. A four-year-old rebel thought he'd gotten away with the perfect crime when he defiantly pedaled, when she defiantly pedaled her bicycle on the sacred pavement of a UK footpath. But the criminal chagrin and duteous officer stringently enforced an ordinance. Thank God they saved them, protecting the walkway from delinquent cyclists and went above and beyond the call of duty by threatening the miscreants to wield property. The parents of little Sophie Lindy were puzzled by the police encounter last week in which the Lincolnshire piece of scum officer stated that he had the authority to confiscate their daughter's bike. 
She rides with her parents on the way home from school. Well, no, there's an ordinance against that. The police car pulled over and she said she had to get off her bike. It was against the law to ride on the footpath. He said the law is the law and she's not allowed to ride on the path. So I'm happy that nothing else is going on in England that could possibly, possibly come in contact with how important this is. Safety is our priority, and cycling on the pavement is illegal, a police spokesman said. Well, maybe the law is illegal. Maybe the law has no right to be there. Maybe the law is wrong. However, common sense obviously prevails, and in these cases of young children, officers would use their discretion and offer the most appropriate advice for the circumstances. Yeah, well, if you're in Lincolnshire and you're a piece of scum cop, what you do is you tell a little girl that you're going to take her bike from her. Um, friends, this is a cops force mentally challenged woman to wear I'm dope t-shirt so that they can ridicule her. Matt Agaris from the Free Thought Project. New York, New York. A lawsuit has been brought against two New York City cops claiming they exploited a mentally challenged woman for their own disgusting buffoonery. According to the complaint, Hannah Biggin, a janitor working the 52nd Precinct Station in the Bronx for the last 23 years, claimed that on May 2013, officers Nicholas Connor and John Rapiti gave her a size 3 extra L t-shirt with the I'm a dope, I'm a, I'm dope at cash cow movement written on it. They then asked her to put it on and pose with Connor while they both cruelly mocked her and snapped photos. She had no idea what it said or what it meant, Biggins lawyer Alexander Coleman told People magazine. This poor woman had no idea that she was being made fun of by these bullies with badges and she cannot read. Not until she had gone home and explained the incident to her sister did she understand what had happened to her. When I got home, my sister Marianne told me what it said and I got really depressed and angry at them for doing that to me because I've never been anything, I've never done anything bad to them. So, um, there you go. The people that like to make fun of others have now been made fun of on this show. Make sure you call the police department that I mentioned there and let them know how you appreciate the way they treat the uh, mentally challenged that are actually showing up for work every day and being a uh, prosperous um, tax-paying citizen. How many times do you hear that for whatever reason they don't carry their own weight or uh, mentally retarded people don't do this or that or that or this so we shouldn't have to pay for them? Well, it sounds to me like she was out there doing exactly what she was supposed to be doing and what she got was ridiculed. Friends at WashingtonExaminer.com Backyard burger and wiener roast targeted by the EPA. So many people laughed when Ron Paul wanted to get rid of the Environmental Protection Agency, but he wisely said that they were an organization that was out of control. And... You know what? After all the failings you see from this in capitulation to the UN, um, the belief that man is warming the planet when we know beyond all reasonable fact that man is not in any way, shape, matter, or form warming the planet, as we know from um, Climate Gate, among other things, we already know this, but no, nope, they know better. The EPA has its eyes on pollution from backyard barbecues. The agency announced that it is funding a University of Cali project to limit emissions resulting in grease drippings with a special tray to catch them and a catalytic filtration system. What should you do? You should go to the dollar store and buy as many cheap little gr grills as you can before they make you buy these. That's what you should do. <coughs> the $15,000 project has the potential for global application. Well, of course. The school said that the technology they will study with the EPA grant is intended to reduce air pollution and cut the health hazards of barbecue pit masters from propane fuel cookers charged with keeping America's air, water, and soil clean. Never mind that you know they don't test our food for Fukushima poisoning. The EPA has been increasingly looking at homeowners, especially their use of pollution emitting tools like lawnmowers. It's been said for a long time they're going to go after the barbecues, they're going to go after the uh, people that mow their lawn, that water their lawn. All of this is under the guise of stopping global warming. And you remember, there is no global warming happening by anything that man is doing in any way, shape, matter, or form. What's happening is, is this is an excuse to get taxes out of people, to get um, 
destroying our money out of the citizenry by the state. That's what this is all about, friends. Um, UN says conservatism is a threat to women's rights, but downplays Islam. That's right. Ron Paul, Rand Paul, Judge Napolitano, Gary Johnson, uh, they're all conservatives, and they are a threat to women's rights. But, you know, not Islam that beheads women for driving, that doesn't let them get an education, that makes them dress like the Grim Reaper in the middle of the summer. No, no, not at all. PJ Dub has a great article, her prison plan. A United Nations report concerning threats to gender equality identifies conservatism as a major impediment, yet completely downplays how the religion of Islam oppresses women all over the world. UN Women Executive Director Fumazil Mlambo Neguka spoke on the issue during the opening session of the Commission on the Status of Women in New York yesterday. Neither she nor a major report prepared for the Commission on the Status of Women meeting. She was addressing a New York identified radical Islamist ideology as a leading factor, although surveys have found that Muslim nations fare worse in general quality rankings, writes Patrick Goodenow, and he's right. Extremism and conservatism are on the rise, manifested in diverse forms across different contexts, said the report, noting that such beliefs are instrumental in tolerating or even promoting violence against women and limiting women's and girls' autonomy and engagement in the public square. And it says, although the report does touch on examples of oppression that are almost universally confined to the Islamic faith, it fails to explicitly characterize the religion as an obstacle to women's rights. Um... <laughs> I'm going to give you some of these facts real quick. Again, this isn't even one of the dumbest stories of the month. Islamic countries are also disappropriately represented when it comes to the problem of female genital mutilation and the rates of the highest, 98% in Somalia, 986 in uh, the population there is Muslim. Other countries include Djibouti, Egypt, Guinea, Mali, Eritrea, Sierra Leone, and Sudan, all of which have significant major Muslim populations. Four of the top five countries with the highest rates of under 18 marriages are also members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And the report failed to mention the rape epidemic sweeping Europe, which is predominantly being driven by Muslim immigrants who see women as second-class citizens. No, they don't get mentioned. Islam, as always, gets a free pass. Now, what would happen if Hindus or Christians were out raping people in mass? I bet you'd read about it all the time. The evil Christians out raping people. I can see the headline. Friends, um, this is Alan Salazar, UK regulation to label women with vaginal piercings victims of genital mutilation. Yes, that's right. While the religion of pieces continues to mutilate and hack off the clitoris of otherwise beautiful women who have done nothing wrong, voluntary piercings, which do no damage to anybody, in the UK will instead be addressed uh, while, you know, the, the hooded fascists are raping women in droves in Europe. This is what they're worried about. A UK health authority plans to equate women who consented to vaginal piercings to victims of female genital mutilation, a controversial effort that could turn thousands of professional body piercers into criminals overnight. Again, you should have no say over what you do to your own body. Next month, the Department of Health says it will implement new National Health Service standards on women who pay to have their labia or clitoris cosmetically altered, labeling them as having undergone a harmful procedure in accordance with rules outlined by the World Health Organization. So, I mean, I wonder if this will lead to underground body piercing. Because we keep hearing, if we don't have abortion, then we women would do it with a coat hanger. Okay, well, by the same token, then, if we don't have licensed body piercers, then women are going to be piercing their body with coat hangers. So, I mean, it's not going to work. It's feminism logic. It says, while there are challenges in this area and adult women may have genital piercings, in some communities girls are forced to have them, the Department of Health spokesman told the London Evening Standard. So instead of calling out Islam, which is what's doing it, they're going to make it illegal for anybody to do it. And it's different. It's, it, when, they, when they do the FGM to women as a punishment, it is not done to protect the sexual awareness of the body. When a body piercer does it, he knows what he's doing, and if anything, it heightens the sexual awareness of the woman. It says, while there are challenges in this area, and adult women may have genital... I read that. The Department of Health characterizes FGM as any procedure that's designed to alter or injure a girl's or woman's genital organs for non-medical reasons. 
noting that a maximum of 14 year imprisonment can be imposed for carrying it out. According to the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, female genital mutilation, also known as female circumcision, affects 23,000 girls under 15 in England and Wales and up to 60,000 women in total. Despite the department claiming it will not go after genital piercings that have been done with, in an abusive context, members of the tattoo and piercing industry are concerned. I bet they are, because political correctness has run amok here, and that's why it gets mentioned here on the Dumdy Show. Um, we've got this too. Pesticide lobbyist refuses to drink glucosamine after claiming it's safe to drink. They want you to drink it. This is Mikhail Thalen's article. They want you to drink it. They want you to have it in your food, but not, not when it comes to them. Listen to this. A lobbyist and public relations consultant for the pesticide industry refused to drink a glass of Monsanto's weed killer Roundup after labeling the substance safe to drink. Discussing the United Nations recent classification of glucosamine, the active ingredient in Roundup, and as a likely carcinogen, we know it causes cancer, Dr. Patrick Moore shot down an offer to drink a glass of the herbicide after initially telling a French filmmaker that humans could drink a whole quart of it without seeing any harmful effects. You want to drink some, the filmmaker asked? We have some here. After stating that he would be happy to, Moore quickly retracted while reiterating that the product is safe. I know it wouldn't hurt me, Moore said, adding that the people trying to commit suicide fail fairly regularly. Yeah, because their body pukes it up, that's all. I know it wouldn't hurt me, he said. So, are you ready to drink a glass of glucosamine? The filmmaker repeated. I'm not an idiot, Moore said. Therefore, if you eat genetically modified food, according to the people who are making genetically modified food, you are an idiot. His words. All right, guys. Um, student records teacher threatening kids and gets suspended. That's right. The student here was a hero. And uh, what did he get? No good deed shall go unpunished. It amazes me that so many of these stories come up, and I think it's becoming commonplace, and that, that worries me a lot, uh, not to get overly serious here on the Dumdy Show. But it, it does worry me quite a bit because it's like our, our stupidity meter is broken in this country. There, there, there is institutions which we've been told to trust, which have turned on us, and yet repeatedly we're supposed to... Um, we're supposed to trust the people who are in control and abusing us and it's stopping students from doing what they should do, which is to prevent abuse, be it done by another student or done by those in authority. In this, in this article, the student filmed a teacher threatening a student, and the student that filmed it was the one who got suspended. Nothing happened at all to the teacher who was doing the threatening, the teacher that was doing the abusing. And uh, what can you say to something like this? Steve Watson, a student in Florida was suspended from school last week for the crime of documented teacher bullying a classmate. The audio recording captured the teacher at Samuel Gaines Academy, remember, call them, let them know you heard about it, telling a student don't let size fool you. I will drop you. You don't know me. That's what I'm saying. So don't give me no look. Oh, well, that's nice. It says the audio also contains a section where the teacher tells the child, you're the biggest kid in the fifth grade, and you're acting like the smallest one. I wonder what your mom looks like. Yeah, you know, g g get the other kids to do mom jokes. That's a good idea. When 11-year-old Brianna Cooper took the audio recording to school officials, instead of thanking her for bringing it to the attention, they called it illegal and suspended her for five days. So what do you do? You call the Samuel Gaines Academy and let them know that you heard about it. That's why I do these shows, people. That's why I do these shows. I'll point out where the stupidity is, but it's up to you guys to bring it home and make it stop. I mean, I'm one man here. You can donate to this one man at the correct views on hotmail.com. Look up our mission statement. I'm trying to make this my job. What I do three hours a day, five days a week. And I can't do it without you donating. Friends, Apple CEO slams religious freedom law after doing deals with countries that execute gays. Yes, that's right. Apple CEO and obviously real brilliant man Tim Cook slammed Indiana's religious freedom law after critics claimed it would lead to discrimination against members of the LGBT community. But such concerns didn't stop him from doing deals to sell iPhones in Islamic countries that execute gays. For those of you that don't know, 
Um, Indiana has said that you do not have to if you are uh, um, if you are making wedding cakes. You do not have to cater a gay wedding. There are enough people that will cater gay weddings. It's up to the person who owns the business to decide, as it should be. Well, um, he's speaking out against that, this brilliant man, mine here, Tim Cook. But he's not saying anything whatsoever. He has no worries at all, no scruples about selling iPhones in countries that kill gay people. And there is something wrong with that. Indiana Governor Mike Pence has vowed to fix the controversial law by passing a follow-up measure that makes it clear that businesses owners cannot discriminate against gays and lesbians. Pence has repeatedly defended the law, saying it's not about allowing businesses to deny service. The measure prohibits state laws from the substantially burden the right of a person, a religious institution, or a business to follow their religious beliefs. Numerous major companies threatened to boycott the state after the measure was passed. Apple CEO Tim Cook tweeted that the tech giant was deeply disappointed by the new law while calling on Arkansas to veto a similar bill. He tweeted, around the world we strive to treat every customer the same, regardless of where they come from, how they worship, or who they love. However, his concern for members of the gay community being treated the same isn't evident when Cook chose to negotiate deals with countries that still execute people for being a homosexual. Cook oversaw the introduction of Apple products into Saudi Arabia in December last year. Saudi Arabia punishes homosexuality with floggings, chemical castration, imprisonment, fines, and executions, including beheadings. Um, he visited the Arab Emirates last year, and um, the two Apple stores in, that, in the UAE are eminent. And um, it says the UAE is only slightly more forgiving than Saudi Arabia towards gay. It meters out punishments of deportation, jail time, and in some cases, death. So way to go there, Mr. Cook, standing up for gay people by allowing them to be beheaded just so you can sell iPhones there. Um, journalists posing as students help start ISIS fan club on the Florida campus. Call the Florida campus and let them know that it might not be a good idea to raise money for ISIS. Daily Caller, Betsy Rothstein. Oh, one of James O'Keefe's investigative journalists went to Florida campus to walk through the hoops of starting a new club at Barry University in Miami. So he was posing as a student just to see if he'd be able to do this, to see if the school was really this uh, demented. And it is. It's not fencing or chess or anything. It's an ISIS club. You know, to give terrorists flashlights, pencils, money, or anything else that they might need. And the whole notion of starting the club is a lot easier than it sounds. On a side note, the school's alumni is Shaquille O'Neal. It says even when the fake student, and that would be Keith's investigative journalist, approaches a school coordinator who helps facilitate the clubs, he doesn't bat an eye, even when told that she wants to do this and that she wants to assist overseas. When he sort of gets to the bottom of what, he, what, she want, what she wants to do, he replied, so you do specifically want to send aid to ISIS. And what do you think happened? It was okay. That's right. It was okay. <laughs> Barry University in Miami was going to allow someone to raise money for ISIS. All right, friends, uh, what are, this, this, this stood out to me as a particular dumb D. And this is the last of the ones we're going to rush through. Garbage man gets 30 days in jail for picking up the trash too early. That's right. This is brought to you by StickerJunkie.com. Do you have some idea what you want your stickers to look like? Kind of, maybe, sort of, good. Go to StickerJunkie.com and tell David Lake your idea. Let him know you heard about it from the correct views. Not only are you going to get great stickers, but you're going to end up saving a fortune um, by telling them you heard about it from the correct views. It says, it's a stiff sentence for someone who is eager to do his job. But it's true. This is from CrimeFeed.com. WSB TV says sanitation worker Kevin McGill was thrown into jail for 30 days for showing up to work too early. Apparently, McGill had recently been hired to do sanitation work in Sandy Springs, Georgia, specifically picking up trash throughout the neighborhoods. It's a job he held for three months. Trash pickup, according to city ordinances, is limited to 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But the overly ambitious McGill was showing up in neighborhoods as early as 5 a.m. Now, again, these ordinances should not trump 
the right for the person to do business the way they see fit. But even then, I can understand that it's on the company's time and they can make their own rules. But to put the man in jail for 30 days is absolutely ridiculous, and it's why you're hearing about it on the Dumb Deal of the Month show. Instead of getting a pat on the back for showing initiative, he was given a citation by the town in order to appear in court. Um, he showed up for his court date, court date, and prosecutors were apparently out to teach him a lesson. They wanted him to sit behind bars for 30 days, and the judge agreed. So, I mean, obviously, that's that's the most important thing they have to worry about there. What do you do? How, how do you fight this? You call Sandy Springs, Georgia. You call the police department. You call the judge. Let them know this is utter BS. This is tax dollars being wasted, friends. This is money that you earned being used to put a trash man in jail for picking up trash too early. Is that our biggest concern in Florida? What, do, we don't have any homeless down there? The elderly population, they all got perfect medical and everything, right? We can spend our money on this. Makes me sick. Um, Supreme Court affirms ruling that displaying the U.S. flag is disruptive. I got three stories on flags here. There's a war against flags in this country, which is just another way to pull the dynamic, to pull the pride of your country away from your citizenry and make it easier to be capitulated into the nightmare that is the UN's one world um, doctrine here. And you can see it done. They're getting us ready for the, uh, uh, the m proposed merger of America, Canada, and Mexico, which will be a disaster. It's a death to sovereignty. It pulls us further into the demands of the UN, which doesn't want to let us barbecue hot dogs. The Supreme Court has refused to review a case concerning California school officials banning students from wearing American flag t-shirts for fear that the garments were being disruptive. That's right, a disruptive t-shirt. The Supreme Court decision was taking place behind closed door Monday. No explanation was given as to why the case of Dariano versus Morgan Hill Unified School District will not be taken further. Make sure you call the Morgan Hill Unified School District and let them know because um, it makes absolutely no sense. What country are we in here? If you don't like America, get the hell out of it. Um, or at least fight to change what's wrong with it, like I am. It says the case stems from an incident in 2010 when students were ordered to remove U.S. flag t-shirts on the Mexican national holiday of Cinco de Mayo. School officials cited concerns that such displays of patriotism would inflame racial tensions. Well, then maybe they shouldn't be allowed to celebrate Cinco de Mayo either. No, a further uh, attack on rights isn't the answer, but you get my point. It says four students were suspended and sent home and a blanket ban was enacted, much to the chagrin of free speech proponents. These critics say that the Supreme Court's decision to let stand the Ninth Circuit Court ruling restricting free speech in this case affirms a troubling precedent that displays patriotism in America and it can be prohibited. When public school students can't wear the American flag on a t-shirt because it might be disruptive, then free speech as we've known it is dead, writes John W. Whitehead, correctly I might add, president of the rights group the Rutherford Institute, which was involved in the original district court case. Again, the Rutherford Institute, all but useless when you go to them to actually get funded, though. I used to have a lot more respect for them. If the Supreme Court continues down the road to political correctness, then eventually anything we say will be treated as threatening and as a loaded gun and deemed just as dangerous, Whitehead said. The Ninth Circuit Court concluded that the heckler's veto theory could be applied to the case, essentially allowing the government to respect free speech in order to maintain order. Um... Any attack on free speech, for any reason, is a slippery slope, and they're trying to get all of us to accept it. And if you're not accepting it, that's probably how you found this show, so you know who to contact and complain. Al Salazar, again, a slap in the face, sheriff ordered to remove the American flag from the courthouse. A sheriff in Virginia is angered after being ordered to remove an American flag displayed from the local courthouse in a move that he is labeling a slap in the face, and it is. The Portsmouth Fire Department recently gifted Sheriff Bill Watson's office with a flag display crafted out of recycled fire hoses, complete with a sign that reads, A Tribute to Public Safety. And it's, it's, you should look it up on the site. It's really nice. It looks really, really nice. It says, When Sheriff Watson attempted to have the display mounted in the lobby of the Portsmouth Courthouse, however, judges blocked the effort, claiming it would set the wrong precedent. What country are we in? 
Sheriff Watson says the judge told him, not only do we not want it on the wall, we don't want it in the courthouse at all. I just can't believe that they don't want to display the American flag in a courthouse. I mean, that's the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my life, Sheriff Watson lamented to CBS affiliate News Channel 3. It goes on that one of the judges, who preferred to remain anonymous, I bet, explained their position to reporters, saying the lobby was an inappropriate location for the display and was unnecessary. Yeah, well, how about all the unnecessary lies that died in order for us to have that flag, you bonehead? Additionally, the judge, who knew not to let anybody know who he is because he doesn't want to be done, found out, said they feared the slippery slope would ensure them that would cause them to allow all types of displays. Sheriff Watson says the explanation is unacceptable, especially in light of the fact that the flag is an obvious tribute to public safety officers like he and his deputies, who are expected to protect the judges from their own li for their own with their own lives if necessary. They expect my deputies to put their life on the line for the judge. If somebody was going to come into a courtroom with a gun, the deputy is supposed to stand in front of the judge and take the bullet, but yet they won't let us have our flags saluting public safety. To me, it is a slap in the face, Sheriff Watson told WTKR, and he is right. The group of judges attempted to console the incense sheriff by granting him permission to post the flag in his personal office, which is situated on the first floor beside the lobby. The sheriff countered, saying that he would prominently display Old Glory on his office window, asserting he will be willing to be incarcerated over the flag dispute. Thank God. In a related story, another flag controversy erupted in the Uni of Cali and Irvine. The student leadership panel voted to ban all flags on campus lobby, and they claim that it's a viable threat of violence to cancel the student governmental meeting. There, are, why, why? You might just say it's a piece of piece of cloth. If it means something, no, you're not getting it. They want to take our sovereignty mindset and our identity away from us. Um, EAG News: Kyle Olson school cancels American Pride themed prom after it's deemed not inclusive. So the people graduating there, if you are proud of your country, then you're not inclusive. Why didn't you go to school somewhere else then? Lexington, Massachusetts may have played host to one of the first battles of the American Revolution, but 240 years later, American pride is considered offensive to the school system. Um, students on the dance committee at Lexington High School voted for American pride to be the theme of this year's prom, which was scheduled to be held on April 10th. But administrators foolishly overruled that decision, saying it excludes other nationalities and canceled the dance. Students swiftly and roundly criticized the move. People consider America to be a melting pot, so the fact that it was even considered offensive is what people are a little surprised about. Uh, student Senea Rao tells Seven News, and again, S N E H A Rao R A O. I mean, so yeah, obviously it's not inclusive. She, it's like Jane Smith, isn't it? It's a little ridiculous, said student Ethan Embry. In my opinion, it's a lot of hypersensitivity and being politically correct. Administrators at Lexington Public Schools, whose motto is the historic meets the progressive future, defended the decision. So now you know who to contact at Lexington Public School and complain. That's why I'm doing this. Given the diverse demography of our community, it was suggested by the advisors that the students come maybe national pride themes so they could represent their individual nationalities. Yeah, who cares about America? It's on and on and on and on. It says um, the theme would not be inclusive. How in the world would any parent in good conscience send their kid to that school after hearing this? If you do, that should be considered child abuse. You're doing your kid a great injustice. Um, DailyMail.uk, two female California tourists arrested for carving huge 8-inch initials into Rome's Coliseum and then posing for a selfie. For one thing, I hate the word selfie. It doesn't make any damn sense at all. It's just a self-photo selfie. Oh, my God. Two American tourists have been arrested for carving initials into the Coliseum in Rome. There's a picture of it. Before they were spotted, the women 21 and 25 were able to carve in a J and an N into the brick wall of the first floor of the west side of the Coliseum. After carving the 8-inch high letters, the women posed together for a selfie. The women, some of the stupidest people I've ever reported on, 
Just two of six million tourists that flock to the Coliseum every year used a coin to engrave the letters La Stampa, reported. They were said to have broken away from their tourist group, but other tourists saw that it had happened and alerted security, thank God. Police charged the women with aggravated damage on building of historical and artistic interest, according to Republica, the kind of boneheads that would paint a mustache on the Mona Lisa. After they were caught, the women apologized to Piazza Dante Police and Captain Lorenzo Lacabone. They said, we apologize for what we did, we regret it, and we did not imagine it was something serious. So serious. We'll remember this for a lifetime. <sighs> so will everybody else. According to the Guardian, the section damage dates back to the 1800s, a key period of restoration. So there you go. Some of the dumbest people you've ever seen you hear about here on the correct views. But no, they didn't get the dunce cap of the month. They didn't get it sent to them because we've got four, three stories left and the stupidity is mind-blowing. MyFox.com Teen convicted after spending $30,000 mistakenly deposited into his account. Now, Christelle overrode me on this. I had chosen this to win the dunce cap of the month. Either this or the next one. Um, but no, uh, she's picked a different one here. Madison County, Georgia. A Madison County, Georgia teen spent the better part of $30,000, which was mistakenly put into his checking account by a bank teller. Now he'll serve the next 10 years on probation and has been ordered by a judge to pay the money back. Why? If the money is in his account, he spent the money that was in his account. The judge and the bank both need to have you guys swarming their phone lines with outrage over the extreme stupidity of bothering this teenager for doing nothing but spending money that was in his own account. The daddy apologized about a dozen times that he was sorry it happened, and the boy said that he was sorry. That's about all he said, victim Stevens Field said. Victim, he's not the victim! It says the victim and the man convicted have the same name, and they both live in Hall, a small town in Madison County. They never knew one another, even though they'd lived on the same street. The 70-year-old deposited more than $30,000 into his checking account after he sold land. The bank teller, who he has known for years, mistakenly deposited into the 18-year-old's account. How is that the fault of the 18-year-old? Madness! CBS 46 talked to a woman who the teen refers to as his mother. I told that woman up at the bank she should have looked over her mistake that she made if she knew that there were three people up there with the same name, said Stacy Sorrow, a woman who raised the teen. And the teen was excited. I would have been too, recalling the moment the teen discovered the funds in his account. Of course, why wouldn't you be? The teen spent the money on a BMW, among other items. It's his money. It was in his account. The elder field said he met the teen for the first time in court. Do you fear he was sincere when he apologized. Fields, I don't know if he was or not. It's like when people say, I'm sorry, I feel like they're just sorry they got caught. Got caught doing what? The money was put into his account and he spent it, you stupid bastard. I hope somebody hits you in the face, you moron. Latine has since been arrested for possessing illegal drugs. They had to nail him for something. Anyone with a pending sentence can come back before the judge for the new charge and have the portion of their sentence that they already have revoked, which means they could have to serve a portion of the jail sentence. So now, when someone, this is another reason not to bank. Plain and simple. Go to themediaspeaks.com, look up how to live without banks, and you won't be sorry that you did. That brings us to the last two stories, friends. The dumb of the dumb, the stupid of the stupid, the moronic of the moronic. Alan Salazar, again, three stories on this one. 11-year-old suspended for a year after the school mistakes an ordinary leaf for marijuana. Not only do we have an innocent 18-year-old getting harassed when money was put into his account by somebody else, but in this case, somebody else confused this leaf, which the kid never claimed was a pot leaf, for being a pot leaf. And the people that were wrong are fine. The innocent child, or the innocent 18-year-old in the last story, get reamed for no reason whatsoever. A Virginia couple is suing, thank God, their son's middle school after he was wrongly accused of possessing marijuana, a false allegation that set off a chain of events that ultimately degraded the student's mental well-being. 
Parents Linda and Bruce Bays have a federal lawsuit pending against Bedford County Schools and the Bedford County Sheriff's Office for wrongfully pinning a marijuana charge on their son, a participant of the school's gifted and talented program. Well, I mean, if he's that gifted and talented, he needs to get the hell over it, too. They aren't sure how a lighter and a leaf ended up in their 11-year-old's backpack, but they're positive the extent of the punishment did not fit the alleged crime. For one, field test of the leaf identified as marijuana by school officials and the county sheriff's office came back negative not once, not twice, but three times. Essentially, they kicked him out of the school for something that they couldn't prove that he did. The family's lawyer, Melvin Williams, says commenting on the boy's 364-day suspension for a leaf. Back in September 22nd, the base son identified as RMB in court documents was summoned to the principal's office, where he was interrogated and asked to empty the contents of his backpack. Assistant Principal Brian Wilson began by asking if he had anything he shouldn't have. He said no, according to the report in the Roanoke Times. Brian Wilson, wasn't that the name of that beetle that everybody th uh, the beach boy that everybody thinks can sing? I think his voice is terrible. The principal then opened a zipper on the front of the boy's bag that revealed a lighter and a leaf. R&B's parents were told that their son was showing off the items to other students in class and inside a bathroom claiming it was marijuana. The student denies that he ever did this. School officials, however, didn't hesitate to exercise the full authority of Virginia's zero tolerance law, moving to suspend the child for a year, which of course would destroy his record and mess up his college hopes to some degree. Also, in research um, that I helped with the dunce cap, I also found that this is not the first per person to be suspended from a Virginia school. So, Virginia, you guys might want to contact some of these Virginia school boards that I'm naming out here. It says, the Bay's lawsuit also names the school's resource officer, Deputy M.M. Calhoun, who you should call, who issued a false testimony before a judge. The field test came back not inconclusive, but negative, says Williams, adding, yet she went to a magistrate and swore he possessed marijuana at school, knowing that he did not. Despite the absence of evidence, RMB was ordered to attend an alternative school full of problem children and near-do-wells. He, uh, he was a gifted student, now he's in a special school for, like, gangbangers. Additionally, RMB was forced to endure bag searches upon entering and leaving the school each day, which didn't sit well with his parents, who got the school to agree to allow him to take homeschool classes following the strictly timed regimen. The base say the events left their son worse for the wear and he began to fall into a deep emotional slump. He just broke down and said his life was over. Well, he needs to pull himself up a little bit here. He's 11, not 4. He would never be able to get into college. He would never be able to get a job. Well, that's a bit of a stretch. I mean, he seems like he has panic disorder to me. But you get the point. They harass the kid for nothing. Having no evidence to stand on, the county prosecutor dropped the case. However, he would still have to follow the school's orders to attend an alternative school apart from his peers and extracurricular activity. For nothing. Even he was been ordered to see a psychiatrist for depression. The school cites the state's vigorous zero tolerance laws as justification for the suspension which makes no distinction between actual drugs and look-alike or imitation drugs but Bay's lawyer said the school doesn't have a legal leg to stand on if the school argues that they were justified in suspending him for possession of look-alike marijuana that's disingenuous because they never argued prior to that suit being filed so they're just trying to lie their way out of it and make sure you call them and let them know that you heard about their story and this poor kid's plight on the correct views and friends you know what that brings us to you know what that brings us to which this story brought me to the dundy of the month the dunce dunce cap of the month award winner and uh let's see if this gives you some idea which direction we're going in let me get let me get properly dressed here that's right you might want to pull back Crystal on that just a tad in order to encapsulate the ears. Friends, the dumdy of the month is unbelievably stupid. And I cannot wait to tell you about it. DEA warns of stoned rabbits if Utah passes medical marijuana. That's right. Oh my god. Such stupidity cannot be made up. These are my ears in honor of you, Matt. Utah is considering a bill that would allow patients with certain debilitating conditions to be treated with edible forms of marijuana. Bunny, bunny. 
If the bill passes, the state's wildlife may cultivate a taste for the plant, lose their fear of humans, and basically be high all the time. High bunny rabbits! That's according to testimony presented by the Utah Senate panel. It's at the 58-minute mark last week by agent of the Drug Enforcement Administration. And I imagine the Easter Bunny will be eating the chocolate on the way to the house. It's ideal in facts, ideal in science, said Special Agent Matt Fairbanks, who's getting the award, who's been working in the state for a decade. Lucky them, the clearly the best and brightest. He is a member of the marijuana eradication team in Utah. I thought the deer and the rabbits were doing that. Some of his colleagues in Georgia recently achieved notoriety by raiding a retiree's garden and seizing a number of okra plants. Okra. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like broccoli, for those of you that don't know. Fairbanks spoke of his time eliminating backcountry marijuana grows in the Utah mountains, specifically the environmental costs associated with large-scale weed cultivation on public land. Ah, my ears. I must be stoned. Personally, I have seen entire mountainsides subjected to pesticides, harmful chemicals, deforestation, and erosion, he said. The ramifications to the floor, the animal life, the contaminated water are still unknown. Now, again, the, the fact that it's illegal is making people grow it in these places. If it was legal, it wouldn't be any more harmful than any other plant. You could do it with cloves. If you ban cloves, you can plant too many cloves in one area and do the same thing to the land that the marijuana is doing. It's only happening because it's illegal. Fairbanks said that some of the illegal marijuana grow sites, he saw rabbits that had cultivated a taste for marijuana. It's true, Christelle. He continued, one of them refused to leave us. And we took all the marijuana around him, but his natural instincts to run were somehow gone. Now, it's interesting because it makes me wonder if maybe there's marijuana growing at the Monument Park down the street. Because in my life, I have pet a muskrat, a number of squirrels, and a couple of ducks. So I'm thinking, rather than natural curiosity, rather than believe that maybe they were domesticated by, you know, things like the feeding of bread and peanuts, no, maybe they were simply eating marijuana and had lost their ability to be afraid of humans. There's no chance that the uh, person who had the marijuana had fed the rabbits and maybe domesticated them. No, nope, none. Not at all. That never crossed my, his, Mr. Fairbanks' mind at all, which is uh, why he's getting a dunce cap. It says it's true that illegal pot farming can have harmful environmental consequences as a link. It says, of course, nothing about these consequences is unique to marijuana. If corn were outlawed and cartels started growing it in national forests, the per plant environmental toll would be, in fact, exactly the same. But then you'd have fat rabbits because it'd be eating all the corn. But backcountry marijuana grows are a direct result of marijuana's illegal status. If you're concerned about the environmental impact of these grows, an alternative is to legalize and regulate the plant so that people can grow it on farms and in their gardens rather than on remote mountainsides where bunnies can eat it. Now, regarding rabbits, some wild animals apparently do develop a taste for bud, and yes, best to keep it away from your pets. But I don't know that the occasional high rabbit constitutes grounds for keeping marijuana prohibition in place any more than drunk squirrels, and as a link proving it, are an argument for outlawing alcohol. Yes, it happens. Maybe that's why I got to pet them. And let's not even get started on the nationwide epidemic of catnip abuse. That's great. Again, you do get your cats high all the time, don't you? It said there was a time not too long ago when drug warriors terrified a nation with images of the devil's weed and reefer madness. Now it seems that enforcers of marijuana law conjuring up a stoned bunny. Not scary enough for the Utah Senate, it seems the panel approved the bill and sent it to the full Senate where it be debated 